All right, so I have uh, Dr. Kaku with me today, and he'll be in Australia for the Think Inc. seminars on June the 5th, 6th, and 7th. People can find out more about attending one of the Think Inc. events uh, by going to thinkinc.org.au forward slash Michio Kaku. So Michio is the author of many bestsellers in the past, but the most recent has been The Future of the Mind. And Michio is here to talk about this book today. So what motivated you to write such a an interesting book. Well, I'm a physicist, and uh, we realize that there are two great mysteries of the universe. First of all is the creation of the universe, and that's what I do for a living. I'm the co-founder of uh, string field theory, and we think that string theory in turn gives us the most compelling version of why the universe sprung into existence with the Big Bang. But the other great mystery is sitting on your shoulders, <laughs> and that is inner space, the mind. Realize that consciousness, self-awareness, these are some of the great unsolved questions of science. But because of physics, we can now read the interior of the, of the thinking process. MRI scans can give us detailed photographs of blood flow in the brain, and we can now connect the brain to computers. And so this means that things that were once considered science fiction, like telepathy, telekinesis, recording memories, photographing dreams. We actually can do it now in the laboratory. And that's why I wrote the book, The Future of the Mind, to tell people that we're in the golden age, the golden age of brain research, where we've learned more about the mind in the last 10 years than in all of human history combined. Right. That's incredible. So as we are entering this golden age of neuroscience, it seems as though a lot of the discourse today seems to be around helping treat mental illnesses, which is fantastic, right? But there are other That's uses. That's right. In fact, um, uh, President Barack Obama um, stunned uh, the world last January when he announced the Brain Initiative, mm -hmm. along with the European Union. They want to dump a billion dollars to get a complete map of the human mind. Mm -hmm. This is called the Connect Home Project. We, ha we already have the genome, where we can put all the genes of our body on a simple disk. In the future, we'll put our connect home on a disk with all the neural pathways of the human brain. And the short-term goal is to cure mental illness. Mm -hmm. Mental illness is one of the oldest afflictions of the human body, and uh, the Bible even mentions um, mental illness. And, but we're clueless about how the brain is hooked up. That's why we want a connect home, a map of the living brain to tell us why miswiring of the brain can cause mental illness. But long term, this means that we'll be able to upload memories. It means that we'll be able to send perhaps emotions on the internet. Perhaps we'll have a brain net whereby we can send memories and feelings and emotions on the internet. And some people even think that perhaps this is one way to live forever. Because mm -hmm. even if we die, our connect home with our memories and our personality lives on forever. Yeah, that's an incredible prospect, and like there are many great researchers. Sebastian Sung, who I know you've spoken to, for instance, has been doing some amazing work in this area. I'm just wondering, you've got a background in theoretical physics. How do you think this shapes your view on the future of the mind as compared to somebody who's just got a background in um, artificial intelligence or neuroscience? Well, I think we need a fresh look at consciousness, which is the 800-pound the gorilla staring us in the living room. Everyone dances around this question. And I read many of the definitions of consciousness written by philosophers and ministers and theologians, and I wasn't satisfied because they define consciousness in terms of self-awareness, but self-awareness is consciousness, and it's very circular. I'm a physicist. We like to rank things. We like to quantify things. We need theories that are testable and falsifiable. And so I came up with my own theory of consciousness. I call it the space-time theory of consciousness. And it means that even animals, in my theory, are conscious. And I even have three levels of consciousness. One is the consciousness of reptiles. That's the reptilian consciousness of snakes and reptiles and frogs, which um, they have a very good understanding of space. And then we have monkey consciousness, the consciousness of emotions and social hierarchies and rankings. And so monkeys are very good at, looking, at, at categorizing each other and understanding emotions through body language. But we, humans, 
we have a third level of consciousness not found in the animal kingdom, and that is time. We see tomorrow. Animals don't. It is almost impossible to train an animal to understand tomorrow. But we obsess about tomorrow. We daydream. We speculate. Our brain is constantly thinking about the future. And then in my book, I even give you a numerical ranking, how you can actually rank levels of consciousness of reptiles, monkeys, and humans. Wow. Do you foresee that there may be another level once we develop different forms of intelligence, maybe as in, in artificial forms, in, in computers, or as we augment humans? Uh, yes, that's, that, that's been asked to me. I call it the space-time theory because consciousness constantly creates a model of ourselves in space with respect to other humans and in time because we speculate about the future. Now, what about robots? Yes, I think that even machines can be conscious. They, too, can analyze their position in space. However, robots have level one consciousness, the lowest level, the consciousness of an insect or a bug or an alligator. And so we have a long ways to go before uh, robots become as intelligent as us. They have no sense of emotions, no sense of bonding, and certainly they do not understand the future. And so I think that robots do not have a new form of consciousness. Their consciousness is basically level one consciousness. Now, what about aliens in outer space? If my theory is correct, it means that if aliens are, quote, more intelligent than us, it simply means they can see the future better than us. That is, they can see outcomes, they can see scenarios with much, de much better detail, and they can outwit us in the sense that they see the future. For example, take a look at a safe cracker. A safe cracker may have a low IQ because he flunked out of grade school, but he can rob a bank uh, and el elude the police because his consciousness allows him to see the future of a bank robbery much better than the police. Mm -hmm. And so his level of consciousness is actually quite high. So my theory does not depend on IQ exams or personality exams. It depends on how you can see the future. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been getting better at understanding or uh, making models of our future and seeing, seeing the future through series of filters, for instance. Humans, for instance, with aid of, of technologies, have kind of, in a sense, enhanced their intelligence, even though a lot of the technologies aren't embedded directly in their brain. Um, we seem yes, to be this getting... gets us into um, uploading memories, which is the, the thesis of the movie The Matrix, when uh -huh. we can upload reality into our brain and become a karate master by pushing a button. <laughs> well, believe it or not, last year, for the first time in world history, the first memory was uploaded and recorded. It was done at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. It was done in a mouse. A mouse was trained to sip water from a flask. Mm -hmm. They recorded the memory. The memory was recorded in the hippocampus, a very small organ at the very center of the brain. Then the mouse forgot the task. But when you put the impulses, the memory, the tape recording, back into the hippocampus of the mouse, bingo the mouse immediately remembered how to sip water from this bottle. And at MIT, they duplicated the experiment, and they even put a false memory into a mouse. Next will come primates. Well, for, for example, when a primate eats a banana, we'll simply record the memory of that and then reinsert it back into the monkey. And the short-term goal is a brain pacemaker for Alzheimer's patients. Yes. That's what's motivating a lot of this research. We're going to have millions of people with Alzheimer's disease wandering our streets, not knowing who they are, where they live. Why not have a button? You push the button and boom, you know who you are and where you live. So a brain pacemaker is a short-term goal. Yeah. But a long-term goal is why not push a button and have the vacation that you never had? Why not simply you know, learn calculus by pushing a button rather than going to college? Um, workers who get laid off because they don't know the latest computer skills, they can learn it. Wow. And so this has enormous ramifications if we can upload memories by pushing a button. Now, we can't do that yet, but in animals, we've now recorded snippets of memory and played it back into the animal brain, and they remember. Wow, that's truly amazing. Well, I guess, lastly, many 
AI experts and scientists have agreed that in some time in the future, a singularity, that is, some form of feedback cycle of intelligence improvement, will be possible. We're often disagreeing about when, but um, what are your thoughts on this technological singularity? Well, if you define the singularity as the time when robots become smarter than us, there are many definitions, but that's one definition. Yes. Then we can start to rank the intelligence of robots. Robots today, our most advanced robot is called Asimo. Asimo has the intelligence of a cockroach. It can barely understand its position in space. You cannot talk to it. You cannot have a conversation. You cannot gossip with it. Asimo has no understanding of who he, who he is. He doesn't know that he's a robot, and he doesn't know what a human is. So that's level one, the lowest level, bug level of consciousness. That's our most advanced robot. However, in the coming decades, we will have robots as smart as a mouse, mm -hmm. and eventually as smart as a rabbit, mm -hmm. then as smart as a cat, a dog, and eventually as smart as a monkey. Mm -hmm. So just before the singularity hits, we will have monkey intelligence inside a robot. At that point, I think that we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts, mm -hmm. because monkeys have self-awareness. They have their own agenda. They don't necessarily have to obey us, mm -hmm. and potentially they could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, this does not mean that they're going to put us in zoos and throw peanuts at us behind bars and make us dance. Mm -hmm. That requires a very sophisticated level of intelligence. But I think that, yeah, in the coming decades, perhaps late in the century, we will have robots as smart as a monkey. But they're not going to take over because we'll make sure that we can shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, maybe in the next century, when they surpass us in intelligence, we'll realize that we might have to keep up with them. We'll be able to upload memories. We'll be able to understand the secret of the super geniuses who have photographic memory. Mm -hmm. We may be able to compete with them on that level. And some people think that maybe we should merge with them. Yes. And this, of course, is for the next century. Why not become homo superior? Supermen, superwomen. <laughs> but of course, that's science fiction, and that's many, many decades away, maybe a century away. But this, I mean, this is surely one of the uh, most amazing things that could happen. Oh, it could be, you know, the best outcome for the human species or the worst outcome for the human species. Yes, well, take a look at, you know, Homo Superior. Uh, for example, Superman or Iron Man. We can create Iron Man today. In fact, the United States Pentagon knows that there are thousands of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan that have injured spinal cords. They have no arm, no leg. So the Pentagon has now connected chips to their brain so they can control mechanical arms and mechanical legs mentally. These are exoskeletons, and I've seen them. They're, they're at Johns Hopkins University outside Baltimore, mm -hmm. and they are incredible. These arms are mechanical. They have the dexterity of an ordinary hand. You can pick up an egg without breaking it. You can shake hands. You can fist bump. You can high five with these hands. And they're controlled mentally rather than by a joystick. And my colleague Stephen Hawking, the great cosmologist, he's lost control of his fingers now. So we physicists have connected him mentally to a, to a computer. Wow. Next time you see Stephen Hawking on TV, look at his right glass. His right glass has a chip in it. That chip picks up radio from his brain, deciphers it, and allows him to control a laptop computer. So people who are totally paralyzed can now read email, write email, surf the web, type, control their wheelchair, control household appliances, and they are vegetables. Hmm. That's incredible. We are certainly living in extraordinary times today, and it looks as though there's going to be a lot more possible in the near, the medium, and the long-term futures. Uh, look, I've been... It's a, a great honor to have you on the show today, Michio, and I'm looking very forward to your uh, coming to Australia and speaking at the three seminars, one in Melbourne, one in Sydney, and I think one in Queensland. And that'll be on June the 5th, 6th and 7th and any listeners can check out the thinkinc.org.au website for more information. Okay, well I look forward to coming to Australia. Excellent. Cheers.